Coming up next, a band who revolutionized 60s rock with a rebellious psychedelic spirit had to change when the decade ended and turned into the 70s. Uh, they transformed in the classic rock 70s with a more accessible sound, bringing in a singer that has since become one of the greatest rock voices of our time. Up next, this rock voice tells us the grandiose story of that period when they added another title to their band name and had this massive rock radio staple, as well as another member from the group. Coming up on Professor of Rock, brought to you by Zenny Eyewear. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever overstretch your Stretch Armstrong doll as a kid, you're gonna dig this channel. It's 24 seven nostalgia. Just subscribe below so that you never miss out on our daily features, our history, our interviews, our videos, straight from the legends. And make sure to check out our additional footage and our new show on Patreon. That's where you can also become an honorary producer and that helps us keep this channel daily. Also check out our new merch, I think you'll like it. So I'm really excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations. I always love these, this program. This is where featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs, along with fascinating insight about their career. Uh, on this installment of Revelations, I'm really pleased to bring you an episode featuring David Freiburg of Jefferson Starship from a recent Zoom session that we did, and as well as some great insight from rock vocal specter, Mickey Thomas, one of the greats. In my mind, he is uh, he's just one of the greatest vocalists of the 70s and 80s. Uh, he currently fronts Starship featuring Mickey Thomas, and he's still got the goods. Here both David and Mickey give us the story behind the creation and inspiration behind the classic rock standard, Jane, a song that uh, is on classic rock radio every single day. David also gives us the details on Jefferson Starship's first album in 12 years. Uh, it was released a little while back. And that's where our story begins on Revelations. Now, as we go into these interviews and this story, I do want to mention our amazing sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. The only eyewear for rockers. You can get a pair of prescription frames or a pair of sunglasses or even reading glasses. Treat yourself today at zenny.com, that's Z-N-N-I.com, and make sure to add some other fabulous features. I always talk about blue blocks. It's helped me with headaches. It might help you. Here is the interview. Jefferson Starship, tell me how that came together after Marty Ballon and Grace had left the band and, and they were kind of going through some changes there. How did that come together? Well, they were going through some changes. Yeah, yeah well, we actually, we, we had lost, that was after this tour we did in Germany where <laughs> this European tour and we lost both Marty and Grace. <laughs> Grace to go combat, uh, you know, alcohol and, and Marty because I don't, because he's Marty. And he, <laughs> he always would do I don't know he, he wants Marty always wanted to do what Marty wanted to do and there is nothing wrong with that he proved that Marty Grace had both left the band uh, the drummer John Barbado had gotten into a serious car crash right about yep. the same time and he was going to be laid up for really for years uh, unable to play drums so there was really a lot of question about whether or not the Jefferson Starship would even try to continue on uh, but the remaining members, you know, Paul Kantner, Craig Chikiso, Pete Sears, David Freiberg decided, okay, yeah, we want to stick together. We're going to try to reinvent the band. And so they brought Ainsley Dunbar in on drums. Journey. Uh, yeah. yeah, Journey and played with Whitesnake, David Bowie, John Mayall. Oh, way yeah. Back, you know. so, um, uh, so then the five of them all started jamming together. And then they're like, well, we need a singer. So... Um, you know, the, and they were all based in San Francisco. I was still living in San Francisco at, right after I'd left the Elvin Bishop band, getting yeah. ready to go do as long as you love. No, actually, I'd already done as long as you love. Yeah. I was getting ready for my second solo album with Bill Simsick. And um, so I get a, call, a phone call, really, just mm -hmm. out of the blue yeah. from the band saying, hey, uh, would you be interested in coming by and meeting the guys and hanging out and doing a little jamming and possibly singing with the band? I'm like, Jefferson Starship? And you know, I'm fresh out of the Elvin Bishop band, so I, again, I'm thinking like, how does how does this work? Yeah. How does this go together? You know, because that's not a, I mean, you know, I knew who they were, but Jefferson Starship was not exactly my cup of tea. Exactly. You know, at that point in time, 
So I was very hesitant about yeah. even even giving it a shot because, like I said, I was just getting ready to go to Miami and start another solo album. So, but so so then the more hesitant I was, the more they kind of interpreted that as, oh, this guy's playing hard to get, you know, so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I really wasn't. Yeah. And so the more I said no, the more they wanted me. So finally I said, well, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I went by and met the guys. We hung out in Paul Kantner's living room and we jammed some and they played me some of the new songs they were working on, one mm -hmm. of them, which was Jane. So I had written this song with my friend Jim McPherson. That was the guy that played with Pete Sears and that's, that's yeah. And uh, it was about a friend of mine whose name wasn't Jane. <laughs> Yeah, I was inspired by your experience with an old flame. Isn't that right? Yeah, That's absolutely. I mean. I'm still friends with her today, actually. Mm. Actually, you read all about it. She wrote a book. <laughs> and nothing, nothing. I mean, I'm, she, she's bigger than, not, she's more than just Jane, you know. She was, she's, she's a fantastic person, actually. But anyway, when you start writing the song, it, it, leaves, it leaves reality, you know, and, it, and it, it becomes the song instead. You know? Well, the lyrics are says, the game, what is the game that Jane's playing that she can never win? I've always been curious about that. Running around. Let's just say my, my wife, Jane, was was uh, loved by a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> but that I wasn't guilty, too. We changed the name. She changed her name to Jane Doe to protect the guilty. <laughs> Well, I also love the lyric in the bridge where it says, we're all those nights spent together only because you didn't know better. I got to know. I love that. You didn't know better. Great lyric writing there. I think that's Jim's. Oh, really? Yeah. He's a great lyricist. He was a, he's a really good, was a really good songwriter. He's passed away too. Way too long ago. He, way too young. He was magnificent person yeah no man that was pretty much what we used to figure we needed another male singer and so that was the tryout song whoever sang that song best was and there wasn't anybody that was going to sing it better than mickey so incredible vocal i think incredible he's a singer i think he's one of the most underappreciated singers of that time because man he could just well yeah He's Mr. Gospel. So when I first sang Jane with the band, I thought, oh boy, this is not anything like any, like the Jefferson Starship I that I had heard or yeah. of in my mind. And I thought, this is pretty cool. You know, we may, we may have something here. So it was really pretty much Jane that did it for me. Another great song, great vocal. How did that kind of come together as a song? Tell me a little bit about that. You know, it was kind of in its rough stage when I first started uh, jamming with the band and rehearsing it and, and we kind of, um, it sort of evolved over the course of um, a couple of weeks. David Freiberg kind of had the meat of the song. He was the primary writer on it. Right. But then we would all kind of add our embellishments to it. And Craig Chiquiso, I think he'd been listening to Toto a lot, or some, some harder rock things, because that's his arrangement. I mean, he, he pretty much figured out how just about what everybody should play. I wrote the changes in the melody and, 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 and Jim and I wrote the words, but you know, that's Craig's arrangement. Absolutely. That's, that's why he's got writing credit there too. So, and Paul, that's Paul's, Paul's, Paul's little, uh, in, little intro to lick. That's why, he, <laughs> that's why he's in there too. I think that Craig came up with the little intro riff on the guitar. Ding, 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 oh, ding, yeah. ding, 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 mm -hmm. ding, 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 um, ding. Which was the just, perfect way yeah. to open up Wet Hot American <laughs> Summer. Remember that song? Yeah. Did that movie when it <laughs> yeah. came on? I yeah. love that. It worked for that, huh? It did. And then for the sequel, too, I think. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. And, um, so yeah, you know, it was, that, was, that was back in the day. When you come in with a song, usually it was in a skeletal form. Uh -huh. And then all the band members would have some input into yeah. arranging it and adding their own uh, you know, individual personality and bits oh, and yeah. pieces to it and stuff. So we did that with Jane. I just kind of brought in my sort of uh, combination of Elvin Bishop Band, Gideon Daniels, blues, gospel deal. You 
you know, and it kind of, for some reason, it worked on this sort of hard rock bed that we had going on with Jeff. Yeah. Quite a departure, like we said, from Jefferson Starship. Well, you know, again, gentlemen, you know I, think, I think I was so lucky, really, with the influences that I had, oh, yeah. you know, with Gideon and Elvin, because I was kind of coming from a, from a different place than a lot of other rock singers were in the late 70s and early yeah. 80s. You know, I kind of had a, it gave me a little bit of a unique vibe there. And then, I, so in my own mind, I said, you know, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. I'll do like, I'll give them three years and two albums, and then I'll be off to something <laughs> yeah. else. So I joined the band, and we went to L.A., and we recorded Freedom at Point Zero. And Jane Which was right the, here. There it is. Yep. He's, he's probably 40 years old now. <laughs> he's <a> kid <laughs> or more. So we did it, did Freedom at Point Zero, came out of the box with Jane as yeah. the first single, and that was the calling card for the all-new Jefferson Starship. And Well, Jane is a, another big hit, another great yeah. song um, from that time. went to number 14, but it went number six, top five on Cashbox, I remember. Yeah, and it was uh, back in those days, you know, um, what was just as important, really, as, as Billboard Top 40 was, you know, what were called the AOR tracks, album-oriented yep. radio tracks. Yeah. Was, you know, because there were still that FM, AM kind of thing exactly. going on back. And FM radio was just as big, but didn't really cater to the Billboard Top 40. Right. So anyway, Jane debuted number one on those tracks. Yeah. Jane was... Massive hit. Number 14 in the Hot 100, number 13. Bless its heart. Yeah. Bless her heart. And number 21 in, in the UK. And that was just incredible. You talk about the incredible vocal, but also, as I understand it, Mickey Thomas was on the short list at the time to be the lead vocalist for Toto before they hired Bobby Kimball. It would point. have been great with them. Was the piano keyboard part in the intro, do you remember what that was inspired by or how that came about? 16 notes, the ding, 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 ding. That was Craig. Craig. What it was inspired by, I don't know. I would assume, hold the line. <laughs> I was talking to I was talking to Steve Luthicker a couple. Oh, last year, I think. And he said, and he said, people kept calling him up and saying, I heard your new single. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what do you mean? We don't have one out. <laughs> Definitely hear a little hold the line there. Definitely there's an inspiration there. Well, your final thoughts on Jane. What do you remember when you were recording it and Mickey just nailed that vocal? You guys had to know that was going to be a scorcher, that it was going to be a hit. Yeah, what well, every we always assumed for it. I, I couldn't somehow every all of us could, couldn't wait just to see what would happen as soon as we heard it on the radio, and it did exactly what we thought it would. Yeah, and Mickey brought Don, Mickey brought Donnie Baldwin into when 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 we had a part ways with Ainsley because Donnie and Mickey were played in um, Elvin Bishop's band when Mickey sang and fooled around and fell in love. And Donnie is still with us today. Matter of fact, we have a new album coming out soon. In fact, I want to talk about that. Ooh, uh, I wish I could play it for you. They'd be pissed if I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. actually an EP. EP. Tell me about it, that. It fits right in with everything that, that you would think that Jefferson Starship should be doing. It's, it's politically appropriate although i wish it had come out about a year ago it should have come out months before this before the pandemic happened you know that that slowed us way down but it's got a song called it's about time which is really it's about time for women to rule the world <laughs> <laughs> and grace actually had a hand it was one of the writers on that grace and jude and kathy wrote it and there's an, another one called What Are We Waiting For? Which is, what are we waiting for? We know what we have to do. We can see the problems that we have and we can solve them. They're solvable. All we, so what are we waiting for? Why don't we do it? And that's one of Paul's favorite things. He, one of his expressions. That's where we... <laughs> oh, yeah. Paul would always say, what are we waiting for? When, you know, waiting for somebody to start a tune or something. You know? And so we, we, got to, we got together in the studio and, and just kind of jammed around and 
And so far from all the jamming around, so far we've got about four or five songs that are done, but there's more, there's still more, more in there, you know, so. Gosh, I can't wait to hear those. You know, sound check will, because, I mean, Kathy lives in Chicago and Jude's, Jude's operating out of Los Angeles, and so time together is precious, man. We're figuring out how to zoom it. See, I'm together, you know. Yeah, oh yeah. You, you would always be sitting across from, from somebody that you were interviewing before, right? Yeah, had to evolve with the times, right? You gotta do what you can do. <laughs> Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment on uh, on Mickey Thomas and David and the Jefferson Starship, this classic song. What are your memories uh, that are tied to this one? You can also get this song and the new Jefferson Starship album and the band's merch by clicking on our Amazon link below. We're going to link to that. It's a great album, this new one. Now, if you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below and you can also become a patron uh, for even more content. Help us keep the music alive. That's what it's all about, to, to keep curating the history of these songs. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.